Thank God for the invitation. It's my last for me to pledge. It's the Lord's my kingdom. Thank you, I pledge you. Let us pray. Great and almighty God, we give thanks for the gift of this day. It's time we can spend together. The suffering that you give us in the sense of unity that you want to be in an organization, such a growing. We pray that this time together will strengthen our every service of ourselves. We ask that you will bless those who are in need among us. We need our service in the community. We pray that you will guide and guide all of us who seek to care for the lost and the lonely. That we pray also on this day for peace. Peace where there is strife, conflict, war. We ask that you would care for all those who are in such situations. We ask that this work may be done to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Thank you, Thank you all. Uh, pledge. Let's sing. Let's sing. I pledge allegiance to the all right, all of our seniors are not here, and I'm not going to start a song. I'm not ready to run out of the building. I do believe we have some fantastic guests today. Okay, in the front table, you gentlemen across right next to Richard. If y'all don't mind standing and introducing yourselves, telling us why Rotary you should do for a day job. So I'm Chris Jones, uh, sustaining God, really, in the second for Calvary and Jones. Yes, that's our day job. Uh, I'm Jason Hill, I'm sustaining God, really, in the community organization, checking on this organization and seeking for. And the right fit for us to be as effective as possible to get back to the community. Um, yeah. Well, welcome. Um, and everybody, please meet me and Chris uh, before or after the meeting today. And I'm looking for more times. Hey everybody, I'm Chris Ginger. I'm a retirement planning consultant with Mutual America. It's my first meeting, and I've heard a lot of good things about Rotary. A lot of colleagues have found good paths to service through Rotary. I thought I would check out. Thank you. Okay, hey, remember the red button is in the middle of the table. The Mitch Lions from North Carolina, if you want to know more about that, Heather Cooper. Right here, we have another, um, is the director of the Hey, Frank, now you're going to sit back from that. Can I do a half dollars? Okay. Anybody have a half dollars? Okay. There you go. 
So that would be a really informative meeting and you can learn more about her vision for District 7, 7, 10. So last week was um, a hard week for a lot of Raleigh Rotarians and um, people families of Raleigh Rotarians. Um, lost three people that have been very special to the club and family members of those that have been special to the club. Um, Cindy Roberts set up an obituary for Greg Hobbs. And I'm sure some of y'all remember Greg Hobbs. He was a Raleigh Rotarian um, uh, several years ago. And he passed away quite young at 65 after battling cancer um, for a while. And um, Enrique Santicana is Christy Santicana's dad. And Christy, and a lot of y'all know, I also um, know you remember Christy was our membership chair for a while. She dedicated a lot of time and effort and her incredible talent to this club. And she also was a really key player in our very successful game club that we had. She had to um, step back from her club duties over the past year because her dad was battling great cancer. And that finally claimed his life last week. Um, and then finally, we heard this morning about Jim Graham, his wife, Patricia Graham, um, passed away last Friday. They've been married for 60 years. So um, I know a lot of y'all remember them, have personal relationships with a lot of um, individuals that are related to these wonderful people up on the screen. I would encourage you to reach out if you don't know how to get up with any of them. Um, Linda can help figure out how to reach out to them, but um, keep them in your thoughts and prayers. And especially um, Jeff and Ray, I've been for 60 years, a um, long time to be married. So, Rotarians are a family, and uh, it's it's nice to hear from family when you're going through this part. So, before we do wrap up, um, I'm going to have Randy Mounts and Kevin Summers come up and talk about it. It looks like they got across the Bay Bridge. Good. Very good. So, he's BBS is on. He's in. Well, last week, uh, there's a trip that the district is hosting to the Dominican Republic that will happen in March next year. It's the second through the night. Just to give you a one minute summary, we will depart Bali and the two flights will be responsible for your air fare. So that's going to cost about seven or eight hundred dollars. And then another five hundred dollars on the is going to do by December 1st. That will do kind of weed out the series of what that cost will cover is basically everything down there once you arrive at the transportation of the sun. Yeah, I go to uh, the destination. Some most of the newer people attending will be hosted in their homes and reside with uh, Rotarians in the local club down there. There will be some people in hotels. We'll have transportation down there and all your meals. Uh, work will begin on Monday, three days of hard work in between four houses. Hopefully, my first week has to be someone finished and we'll furnish them and then Friday shipping smoothly. We'll have some time to do some site and then return the following Saturday. So, if you're interested, 
Again, the key element there is you have to put in $500 deposit by a set of words. Thank you, Kevin. Um, he also, Kevin has a PowerPoint um, from the meeting last Wednesday. If y'all are interested about the meeting with Rachel, go chat with Kevin and email that to you. Now, Randy is going to come chat with us about a few things. Any text for this week? Last week, I'm sharing that. Uh, so, last week, my wife and I uh, attended a district event, uh, uh, Mike Napoleon. I uh, wanted to share kind of like what came out of that. We saw Lynn Carpenter from, I think she's from a few ways from the interview, perhaps, but um, she gave a presentation of a trip that she took to Pakistan, Pakistan and shared like, her observations uh, and experiences from that trip. And, and I'm telling you, her testimony was terrific. So if you have an opportunity to go see her present, she has a great slideshow, and she talks about uh, what it's like living in a country where polio still exists and it is around and it's not completely eradicated yet. So just remind me of the good work that we're all doing and, and, and that we support to completely uh, eradicate polio. Um, also going to that district event, I uh, think the opportunity to uh, work a room a bit and, and say a few words, uh, make a pitch for our fundraiser, the, the fall barbecue fundraiser uh, at Ace Farm and Hillsborough coming up on Veterans Day. Uh, and that led to an invitation to my Apex Rotary uh, for me to visit their club and their meeting last week. So I did a stand up, uh, say a few words about our event, uh, pass around the QR code. Happy to see some, uh, folks uh, scanning in the, the phone. Uh, so hopefully we'll get some, some action from, from the Apex crew. And you know, I thought, you know, in the interest of love reciprocity and, and, and you know, cross pollination, I thought, hey, I'll stand up and back with you guys. So, uh, I'm going to share here an event from uh, Apex uh, Rotary. They're having a Let It Snow event December 2nd from 3 to 5. And this uh, benefits six different uh, charities, including the Barbara J.C. Burn Center, uh, YMCA, we built the campaign, uh, Western Way, we've got a private ministry, and the Wake uh, Tech Foundation. So it's a good, good charity that it supports. And so if you're in that area, I just want to go have some fun. And, uh, we're going to, you know, Manufacture snow, so they can go out and get some bread and water beforehand. So it feels real. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so this. Thank you, Randy. Randy's only been at Gregory a few months. He's already making the rounds across the district. We don't operate an asylum here in Raleigh, Gregory. We encourage y'all to go out, um, go visit some other clubs. And if you do visit another club before our veteran state boundaries, please do stand up and get that applaud. So thank you, Randy, so much. Tiffany, wrap. Hi, everybody. So this week's raffle is for $30, but I have an IOU because I don't have any change. So bear with me. Oh, I have a raffle. Oh, Eight zero zero four ninety four. One last name. Is that going to go for more coffee to help get a rejection? <laughs> Thank you, Tiffany. Okay, John Hayes. And come give us nothing on the hundreds. You can do this. Hey, um, we're counting down and stop 12 days and count. Our SPPs are due to be identified this coming Saturday, November 4th. Um, we're excited about these fellows that are coming from Duke, Carolina. In case you don't know, there are almost 20 peace fellows representing 18 different countries, including places like Uganda, Nigeria, Malawi, Japan, Australia. And I'm really excited about having them out to the farm and sharing a little bit of Southern hospitality with these folks. That their plans are to go back to their country after learning public health 
and other wonderful things and make their country a better place. Oh, and by the way, one of the peace spells is from Palestine. So, your, your support of this supports efforts that will go back into helping Palestine through the, through the uh, Rotary Peace Spell Foundation. Important work. Also, um, we're helping the um, Veterans Life Center, which is, like you say, in between the two speakers, that they are saving the lives of 21st century veterans that are suffering because of their experiences in war. So we're really excited to talk about these. I want to thank Sue, who's been coming and visiting. She's connected us with the Carolina Cutups. Carolina Cutups are a local Orange County bluegrass band, and they're going to be performing for us for a couple hours during the event. Uh, we have a lot of fun planned. Um, we're short of where we thought we'd be as far as ticket sales. We're around 58. We could handle up to 180 people. So we've got a ways to go, a very few days to do it. And we're right now at $6,000 plus that we've raised, and we're trying to get to $15,000. Uh, there's a list of people that have stepped up to support the event, and we thank all of them. Um, I want to encourage everybody that to think about when you go out in your daily moving group to ask for auction items. Give you a perfect example. I go eat at Seaboard Cafe. I see Rick. Hey, Rick, would you like to get a gift certificate? Yeah. I say, nice one out. I go with my buddy who's from his Buffalo Brothers. Hey, how about it? Would you like to come to the event? I'm going to get you some gift certificates. So try to make this front of mind these last few days because we want to take it over the top. So RSVP today. Thank you, John. Um, for those that want to purchase a ticket right now, there's QR code. So you can also scan it, say, take a screenshot of where the website is, um, take a screenshot of that, and then use it later. Thank you, John, so much um, letting us use your beautiful arm. It's going to be a really fun event. Hey, okay, up next is Richard Averett, Service Report. President Gary Nichols, Richard David, service chair of the Burger Club. Uh, this past Saturday, we had our trunk retreat. It was very successful, well attended. Uh, special, special shout out to Shakes, Kevin, and Carrie for coming. And I believe that Devani Johnny was there as well. Right? And um, it was obviously uh, it was a, it was a uh, very hot day on Saturday. And I just wanted to sweat the kids. So thank God we'll get back to some uh, regular cool weather tomorrow. Thanks for that. Um, so, uh, Project November, uh, so obviously the 11th coming up, but we all understand to buy tickets. So thank you for calling. Last week we had because we had a challenge to sell 10 tickets. We sold about eight, so everybody loves to Um, and then on the 18th, we will be going to, uh, the new, uh, new office for No Woman, No Girl. You recall it's a nonprofit that supplies essential items. So uh, young girls who uh, are at risk can go to school and women who need these items to work. They will be having an event from 10 to 1, which will be organizing all things for so inventory, donut, um, stocking, reorganizing, very much like the um, no pocket and folks have done that. It's a uh, very impactful lift, an easy lift. That'll be November uh, 18th. It's still, I know we don't have a meeting the 20th, it's linked up to Thanksgiving, but. I think we can get enough people. And then December, we start our salvation of uh, all rain, no rain. The link's going to go out very soon. We sign up. Uh, this is a very impactful event. This is a very important event. This is a, a signature event. And this is one we're not going to lose this year. Again, we're going to retain it. And uh, also, as I told you, I'll preach this every day. This is where you can learn your fellow mission. You are going to know Kennedy very well. I mean, Kennedy's the only Detroit Lions fan I know. Uh, I encourage you to sign up. Don't rely on the retired folks who fill up all the spots. Do what you can. Uh, again, uh, we've asked for a minimum of six, but uh, we know there's life and work. But um, this is a very impactful 
and a very important project in Georgia. Thank you all for the privilege of your time. Thanks, Richard. Um, a little shout out or keep an eye out for more information about the November 18th event. And Bill and Kevin, which one of you all is heading up together this year? He's going to head up the Salvation Army um, bell ringing. So, more info coming from Richard and Kevin soon on that. All right, we have an exciting second reading today. Let me pull out a little quick suit if you could step up here. As soon as coming up, um, John mentioned that you put a hand in touch with what was the name of the band? The Carolina, the Carolina Cut Ups. So Sue is a musician, um, and in her in her application to the club, which has been reviewed by the board and approved, that's the process. The board approves applications for new members. Then um, new members come up or. Um, potential applicants come up and they go through two readings before induction. So in her application, obviously an interest, it lists some of the instruments that Sue plays, and I was amazed when I was looking at this. So I'm going to read the list so quickly. Sue plays old-time string band music on the fiddle, Depression-era jazz on the ukulele, and sings three-part harmonies with the sucks. I can't even say it to you. I, I say it's sorry. So just speak silence. Trio. Um, the sirens occasionally perform at assisted living and memory care facilities around the triangle. Sue also likes swing dancing and square dancing. She also likes building, renovating, sewing, gardening, kayaking, and camping, which is right up our service products alley. Um, she graduated in 1983 from the North Vocational School in Troy, Ohio, with a commercial art, photography, and printing degree. And she graduated in 1988 with a BFA from Columbus College of Art and Design with a degree in science. So, Sue, I know there are a lot of um, service organizations out in this area. Could you come up and tell us a little bit about why you chose Brooke? Let's get a little over here. Um, I, well, I think you, when you gave me a night and days, and I was just telling David, I was at a conference this spring. And one of the speakers was talking about the Rotary Club, and I thought, gosh, I heard of Rotary, obviously, it's been around forever, but what exactly is Rotary? So as soon as I got home, I looked it up, and I called Linda the same day, and we had such a great conversation. But what I love about Rotary is that everyone is unified. You know, it's a networking group, that's great, but what I love is that you're all um, serving a common purpose, which is to give back, and that is what I really love. Thank you, Sue. And um, we mentioned last week, it's obvious that you do love getting back here and already taking photos with us. You're already putting people in contact for our fundraising. So, if y'all have not met Sue, please do so. Um, she is fantastic. Um, so, come meet her after the meeting today. All right. And Harrison and should be back, I think, next week. Hopefully, yeah. So if he, those that haven't heard, just had a new baby about two weeks ago. So everything's going well. He's enjoying time with his younger daughter and wife. So last Thursday, we had a service social at Ocean Pizza, which was a really cool place on the way Forest Road. Um, a lot of beer on top, a lot of, it was really neat, really. It looked like good pizza, too. Um, we collected toys for cots, and Cindy Roberts, I don't did not see her come in, but this is her first company, Merriman Realty, that is um, providing up to them to collect these toys. So we will give her the toys, and she will drop them off at the drop spot. So it got me thinking um, about the impact of our service sessions. We've had four so far. And we have collected backpacks for youth, and which is hundreds of pounds of supplies for um, youth that do not have access to school supplies. Then two service socials collecting snacks. One of those collections went to, I believe, at Apex High School, and the other one was going to an elementary school local here in Raleigh, and then between the first talk. So those service socials are wonderful. Please try to come out to our November one, and we will have a full on that coming up soon. No birthdays or anniversaries this week. 
So that means we get to move right on to a very exciting talk about animals. So David, like you are going to be the speaker. I am. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Good luck here. So um, we had uh, Kim Jensen scheduled as our speaker. She's the head of the SPCA, and she has COVID. So I thank her for not going to be speaking to us today. Yeah. Um, so Monty, Monty Lamb is a, um, is a um, native of uh, North Carolina. She uh, is vice president of uh, the land um, for, for the SPCA. Um, the SPCA is actually uh, the, um, the largest uh, animal um, welfare organization in the entire state of North Carolina. They, um, they partner with uh, 58 different counties and have a, have a budget of over, over $5 million. Um, Monty came to, to the SPCA by a company which is called Ink Dog Design. Ink Dog Design was doing the work for the SPCA, and Monty was so um, driven by the purpose of the SPCA, she came on board. Now she helps with uh, uh, um, a fundraising. They're doing a very, very large um, uh, project, which I know that she'll share with. She's helped with that capital campaign. Um, Monty is married to, to her husband, who is a um, NC State veterinarian and um, uh, professor and Dr. Adam Berkenauer, and um, they, they live in Raleigh with their several adopted dogs and cats. So without further ado, on land. Thank you, David. And thank you all so much for having me here. So, my name is Monty Lamb, I'm the Vice President of Plan of the, the SSCA of North County, and that's the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. It's my job to connect people to the mission of the SPCA, and I'm so passionate about what this organization does, and I love sharing it with people. Over the next 20 minutes, I hope I can surprise you or inspire you, or maybe you both. A few things you should know. SPCA Lake was founded in Raleigh in 1967. We are an independent 501c3 animal welfare organization and shelter. And we are funded with charitable support. All of the work I'm about to share with you is made possible by our generous donors and volunteers. Our mission is to transform the lives of pets and people through protection, care, education, and adoption. Our vision is to create a humane community. Okay, despite our locally focused name, we work in 59 North Carolina counties for collaborative partnerships that save pets and help people. We are headquartered in South Raleigh, just about two miles south of the Beltline. 70% of all North Carolinians own pets, regardless of income, age, sex, race, religion, education, political affiliation. 70% of us own pets. Pet ownership is truly a uniting factor. Most of the 70% say they consider their pet to be a part of their family. And more than half of those pet owners, when asked, said they would choose their pet over a spouse who was stuck on a desert island pet. People truly love their pets. And for many of us, the connection, the bond that we share with our companion animals rivals some of the closest human relationships in our lives. This will help to understand that. <clears throat> we met Etta back in 2008. Etta was a homebound senior pet owner who happened to casually share one day with us that she routinely would only take half her monthly heart medications so she could afford to continue to feed her best friend and only companion, her pet dog Charlie. 
To Etta, having her companion is the most important thing in our lives, even more important than her life. Our informal surveys revealed that she was not alone. Low income seniors were consistently jeopardizing their own well being to provide for their pets, which they were desperate to keep with them and not have to surrender them to an animal shelter. Because of that, we created our pet food assistance program, which is focused on meeting the basic needs of pet owner families so they do not have to choose between feeding themselves and feeding their pets. Our goal is to keep pets in their homes and out of shelters by providing pet food and supplies to families, often senior citizens, in need. During the COVID-19 pandemic, our pet food assistance program grew by 70% to accommodate the urgent community need. Also during this time, we were contacted by Meals on Meals of White County. They had started noticing their clients' plates were often left on the floor. When they asked why, they discovered their clients were regularly sharing their own meals with their pets. Seniors were going without so their pets could eat. So our program grew even more. We formed a partnership with Meals on Meals of White County to distribute pet food to their pet owning clients. And as of last year, we were partnered with seven local agencies to provide nearly 160,000 pet meals to pet owning low income families and homebound senior citizens annually. Keeping pets in homes and out of shelters is an important strategy in reducing the overwhelming number of animals entering shelters daily. In fact, we call this retention, and it's one of our three core strategies. However, SPCA operates a multifaceted approach to addressing at their roots the issues around the federal population and the unnecessary euthanasia of valuable animals in North Carolina. These three broad strategies include retention, prevention, and adoption. Let's do retention first. Keeping pets in their homes and out of shelters. Our retention programs focus on people at risk of surrendering their pets to an animal shelter to help them overcome temporary hardships so their pets can stay in homes where they're loved. Our community and pet programming bridges the gap between human services and pet services by offering safety net programs such as behavior health, wellness clinics, pet food assistance, and the Faith First Pet Helpline, which was created in response to the great community need we saw during the pandemic. When it comes to animal welfare, prevention, mom has rights, and the ounce of prevention is truly work of young people. We work to prevent tomorrow's homeless pets by providing accessible and affordable low cost spay neuter surgery. The SPCA operates a high volume low cost spay neuter clinic that annually alters over 5,000 dogs and cats. Our decades long investment in community wide spay neuter efforts has profoundly decreased the rate of animals entering local shelters. And this is a picture of Lolita in patches. <laughs> so she cracks me up. Um, so Lolita really wanted to get patches fixed so she didn't have to manage the inevitable, unintentional offspring that might result. But Lolita's husband liked to show the patches off around the neighborhood. So he wouldn't agree to have her fixed. We were able to discount the surgery fee to just five dollars, price Lolita could afford to have her husband even knowing. So she made the appointment in secret and told her husband that Patches needed to have a lump removed from her belly, which would explain the scar. Patches got fixed. Lolita was happy, and her husband continued to proudly show the patches off to the entire neighborhood. Happy endings all around. <laughs> and last but not least, pet rescue and adoption. Placing shelter animals in homes is probably what we are best known for. SPCA rate of rescues and rehomes over 4,000 homeless pets each year. The majority of these animals come to us through our collaborative partnerships with animal agencies and municipal animal shelters across North Carolina. We transfer animals into our care from rural areas of the state, helping to relieve overcrowding and increasing each community's capacity for care. For more insight, into the SPCA of the county, I thought it'd be fun to share some frequently asked questions that I get personally. So these are my personal thank yous from people that know I work at the SPCA. Question number one, can you stop with the commercials? You know, the ones with the certain platforms on. Okay. 
but this question gets to the part of how SPCAs are set up. They aren't our merchants. They belong to the ASPCA headquartered in New York City, and that's the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. The ASPCA is not an umbrella organization, and we do not receive funding from them. In fact, SPCA is just a generic term for the Humane Society, and we aren't affiliated with each other. There is no national or state umbrella organization. We are all supported by our local communities. Boots on the ground and the welfare work happens at the local level. Sorry, I can't do anything about the commercials. <laughs> Question number two. How can you work there? I take them all home. This is me, smallness. But I feel like people who usually ask this question don't know that animal shelters are truly, truly happy places. Last year, we sent home almost 4,300 animals. That is a lot of happy endings. SPCA Wake is also a managed admissions animal shelter, which means we only take in the pets that we have room for. We don't immunize pets to make room for more. Although we don't immunize for time and space, that's a luxury we are painfully aware of our peers at government fund shelters do not have. So we do feel a high sense of urgency. As Dan told you personally, I'm married to a veterinarian, so my animal count is something you will not discuss. <laughs> <laughs> Question number three How can you work there and witness people's cruelty to animals? This is a hard one. We used to be more involved with enforcement and punishment, and now that's fully function, that's fully a function of the police and law enforcement. We now focus on education and prevention. Our prevailing belief is that people do things not out of malice, but out of ignorance. Education is our very best weapon against cruelty. We believe in people and we want them to succeed. Next question. What's next for the SBCA in County? I'm so So as a result of our work in the state, SPCA Way has identified a need for the people and pets that isn't currently being met. We're building an answer, and we envision one campus with many solutions. Located at 200 Pet Finder Lane in Raleigh, on a 200, on a 22 acre track of land, this regional campus includes our existing pet adoption center that will be joined by the new Pet Admission and Resource Center. This campus will serve as a place for the community to come to for help, as well as a central hub to deploy resources across the state. This new campus will allow us to have more prevention and more lives saved, to expand our safety net services, and to provide youth education programming. So far, we have raised $16.9 million out of $21.5 million dollar budget. So it seems unreal to say out loud. We are launching our great ground in mid-2024 and to open in late 2025. So that is our new building. With this expansive building project, we've been thinking a lot about the future of the SPCA of Boyd County and our community. And just recently, we had the chance to ask some future leaders what they thought about the animals. So I wanted to share this short video and Jennifer's going to make a call whether the video is going to work or not. <laughs> so, fingers crossed. Unfortunately, I think there's too much of a lag in there, but it's really enjoyable. I'm going to send down the link to all of you so you can see that fun video. Basically, the kids just have a lot of ridiculous, no nonsense, you know, nonsensical answers to questions like, what do you think is compassion? Well, what do you think we do here at the SPCA Lake County? So listening to 
this double through their answers is truly a gem. So I, I want you all to have that experience. We'll send that out the other week. So I was wondering if you had any questions. Yes. I, I heard that uh, during COVID there were a lot of pet adoptions. And then when people started going back to work, there was a lot of need to turn pets back in. Did you see that here locally? So the question was, um, during COVID, there was an increase in pet adoption. Did we see locally people bringing their pets back to us after, um, after the COVID quarantines ended? No, we did not. We think that was in large part um, a story that seemed really good and really believable. We did not see that increase. However, we are seeing, um, we call it COVID related or COVID adjacent um, animal surrenders now. So after the after COVID aid ended, the housing, you know, the, all the things that the government had put in place to, um, for COVID relief, those have ended very recently. And so we are seeing people surrender their animals now. And, and usually that's because of financial hardships, which have those safety net programs to help um, to help off, offset. Hey, do you um, take in any farm animals at all? Do we take in any farm animals? No, we do not. We just don't have the capacity or the, the housing for farm animals. We do work with um, some farm rescue groups where we try to direct any loss or any farm animals to those rescue groups. Yeah. Being a shelter, how do you how do you deal with the rescue? What was the last part of that? Okay, great question. So being a no kill shelter, how do we deal with the aggressive states, um, or the aggressive dogs that exhibit aggression? Um, let me first start out by saying the term no kill, um, we don't use it anymore because it turned out to be so divisive. So we are what is considered a no kill organization. However, when you think about our peers of the municipal government when shelters have had open door policies, they can't. You know, they can't manage conditions, they can't shut themselves down, and only take the animals that they have space for. It creates this alternative where a well, we're no field, they are high field, which is no good for anybody. And we want to collaborate and we want to treat them as peers in the industry. So I just want to address the term, the term no field. So we, so dogs are not, um, so dogs and cats, all the animals, are judged each in their unto their own individual character. So we don't have um, you know things like there are certain breeds that are aggressive, there are certain um, size dogs that are aggressive. Each dog gets its own judgment. We do, if the dog is a danger to the public, we absolutely do humanely recognize. So even back in the when we did use the term no kill, when organizations across the country use the term no kill, usually that does exclude euthanasia, humane euthanasia are on grounds of okay, danger to the public. Um, this animal has a disease that can't be medically, um, can't be medically treated. So humane euthanasia is, is always an option. But that's a, that's a great question. I have another one. Yeah. So what is the process of animals getting to the shelter? Do you go out after you hear of a animal cruelty case, or do people bring you their pets? Great question. How do we get animals? Um, the answer is kind of all of the above. So the main source of animals are rural animal shelters that are overcrowded. Um, they have, uh, they, they're they overcrowded and they don't have a good source of people coming in for adoptions because it's in rural North Carolina. So we go out to them and we ask them, who do you have to euthanize this week? Help us select, help us select the animals that you have to euthanize this week and we're going to take them back to the SPCA. And what this does is it creates a capacity in that animal shelter. So all of a sudden they don't have to do 17 euthanasias. Those 17 animals can come to the SPCA. That gives them time to clean, it gives them time to vaccinate other animals, and it gives them time to find animals' homes. And it just gives them some breathing room. So we, when we talk about increasing each community's capacity for care, that's that's what we mean by that. So that's our main source. We're going out to other those municipal run 
government shelters and working with them to take animals off of their plates and bring them to our animal shelter. The other way we get animals is, um, we call it shelter diversion. So we would love to just keep animals out of the, the municipal sheltering system, period. So let's say, um, you know, your Aunt Bertha is going into a rest home and it doesn't allow dogs. And her beloved dog, nobody else in the family can take it. So Bertha comes to us. Um, so we take owner surrender animals as well. Um, in terms of partnering for cruelty cases, we have law enforcement partners. Um, the HSUS is active in North Carolina to help with incidents of puppy mills, shutting down puppy mills. Uh, well, they work with law enforcement, I should say. Uh, and so we'll sign up to one of those shelters that takes animals, takes dogs, takes a bunch of dogs from a puppy mill. So I hope that helps. I yes. hope that answers that question. Yes. Okay. Oh, yes, sir. Do you allow adoption with electric fences? Do we allow adoption with electric fences? It depends. So most most every answer, when you were to ask me, I would my answer would be it depends. Um, some dogs can be contained with electric fences, some do not. So it all depends on the safety of the animal. Can that dog be safely safely mainly contained in an electric fence? Or is it gonna be a dog that just runs right through it and then poses a risk to, to himself. So it, it depends. Yes. Are most dogs now shipped, microchip? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, so the question was are most dogs and cats uh, now shipped with microchip? <laughs> Absolutely. And that's one of the things we do to keep animals out of animal shelters or to get them home as quickly as possible. So that microchip can provide an instant identification for that animal, so that animal doesn't have to sit taking up space in an animal shelter. It can immediately go back home. That's the reason I asked because my wife and I found a dog at a park a few months ago. We took it to a vet, and they scanned it, and there was no chip. So we, we didn't know what at that point. We didn't have much choice. We had to take it to the show. Yeah. So not not everybody is choosing, but uh, most. Most animal rescue organizations and animal shelters are chipping these days, but obviously there's still good supply of animals that don't get a chip. But believe it or not, a collar and a tag works wonders. So, you know, I'll to that dog that you found with a very simple collar and tag. Yes, about. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't think that was us in particular, but I do know some some local groups um, offer that. It's a it's a good way um, to like you said get animals out of the animal shelter and into um, into somebody's home. So the question was, do we do a furlough program or something to get animals out in the home to give them a break, a respite from the shelter? Um, we do have what we call a co-op program, which is open to our current foster volunteers. So, so getting getting cats and dogs out of the shelter and into homes and private homes where they can experience that home environment and really just have a break from the animal shelter is really important to um, the overall health and well-being of that animal. But sometimes, you know, shelters can be, we call them glass boxes. We don't have any chain link fencing, but we have the animals are in glass rooms. So that could drive me crazy. So we do love to get them out of the shelter into homes for a week, two weeks. And then when they come back into the shelter, they're brand new. And all of a sudden, people notice them because they haven't seen them on the website. And then all of a sudden, you know, that gives them a fresh opportunity to be adopted too. So it's a great program. I encourage any of you to participate in that, whether it's SPCA or another group. How are the families vetted? Um, do we have to do a background check or what's the process like? We do not do a background check. And this is um this so okay. So the question was how uh, how are families vetted? So how are our adopters vetted prior to adoption? Great question because this is highly controversial in the animal shelter versus animal rescue group community. So we ask people questions and we believe them when they tell us. 
we trust their answers when they get them to us. So we don't do any kind of extra verification. Um, we look at the adoption process as an education process. And again, we truly believe when people tell us, yes, I understand the implications of this and I'm going to care for that animal. We don't do any vet checks, no income checks, no yard checks. Um, but again, uh, you go to a rescue group um, that has a smaller population in place, and they're going to be maybe more choosy and maybe ask for more, um, more background checks, more vetting, and, and that is absolutely their prerogative. We try to keep in mind that any animal we send home means the animal is not going to be euthanized at one of our shelters. So we kind of feel, you know, this heat, you know, that there's a fire uh, under our feet to, to get that animal into the home. It, would you, you speak to our uh, role, both your donor base and your volunteer base? Uh, I'd love to talk about that. So the question was how broad our donor base and how broad our volunteer base are. Um, I want to talk about volunteers, first of all, because people donate their time, which is precious. We have over a thousand, I think it's 1,300 active volunteers. That, to me, above any other metric, is a testament to the SPCA, how beloved the SPCA is in the community. That many people are coming out and giving so freely of their time. It's something like 23 or 24 full-time equivalent employees. Basically, we, we couldn't run the business of the SPCA without volunteers. So we are um, it, it completely blessed, and I'm honored to be talking about our amazing volunteers. Um, same with donors. All our work is done because of donor support. About 88% of our budget is charitable support. We don't get any tax money, um, no government funding, no federal, no state funding. And like you heard in the ASPCA answer, we don't get any funding that's sent to the ASPCA. So we don't get any infusions from umbrella organizations because there are no umbrella organizations. So I think um, the fact that our donors support our work is truly, truly a testament to um, to how much people authentically appreciate what we're doing because they open up their wallets and we give them money and we're so grateful. Do you have any other foster um, or volunteer, you know, whether dog rescues or foster organizations? Can we work with any other dog rescues or foster organizations? Heck yes. <laughs> yeah, we are all about collaboration. Um, we work, it goes both ways. So we've taken animals from foster organizations, rescue groups, we take them in and we also send them out. Um, we may do trade-offs with, um, I think we do that with Pete Lab Rescue. Like we've got some animals, that we've got some dogs that are very lab-like, maybe have just sat around the shoulder for a while, so we're gonna trade them out with Pete Lab Rescue for some of their dogs that aren't moving. Um, we are very, very good at collaboration. Sure. Any other questions? This has been such a privilege. Thank you so much. Honey, thank you so much. That was great. And are you available to answer some questions if people think about it? Absolutely. Yeah. So, for the Park Exchange and Rotary Club, and I love Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, um, Arnie, I just said she'll be around for a few minutes if you have additional questions. Um, I need to talk to you about Carolyn um, Cassidy. Please are a for fundraiser. We still want to um, sell more tickets if you have time to visit another club. Please promote our fundraiser to another club. Um, great to see everybody and hope everyone has a great week. Before we leave, could you repeat after me the four way test? And the things we think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? I think
will get a chuckle out of this. So, my name's John. I work for Transon. We do real estate options and things like that. We have a great relationship with Richmond. We've done several options with them and sold real estate. Oh, well, be... And we just had, I should see, because it came today in the meeting I was in. Um, you did great. I will see you the next meeting. Beautiful. Thank you.